All right. Um, Lauren M. Spears, Narragansett Executive Director of Tomoquad Museum, holds a master's in education and received a Doctor of Humane Letters honoris causa from the University of Rhode Island for her dedicated work. She is an author, traditional artist, and shares her cultural knowledge with the public through museum programs and, I would like to add, webinars in the case of uh, in our time of coronavirus. So with that, uh, please start, and I'm going to Hello everyone. Asku Wikwasen, Natasuis Makasini Pashao at Nahai Gansek, Natasuis Loren Spears at English at Knupiam at Aki at Nahai Gansek. Well, hello everyone. Um, my traditional name is Makasini Pashao, and um, most people call me by my modern name, Loren Spears. And as you know, I'm the executive director of Tamaquag Museum, but more importantly, I'm Narragansett Niantic, and welcome to the homelands of the Narragansett people. So today, um, we're going to be talking about indigenous collections, um, specifically archival and library collections, the care, the research, and representation. And um, I started with an image from our collection just to kind of uh, ground us in that. Um, and so this is a great image of in front of the Narragansett Indian Church from uh, the early 1900s. So I just wanted to just sort of give you an opportunity to share that. Having a little text. Oh, there we go. Moment, I didn't think it was going to work. Um, so I'm going to try to like that collections care. Um, this happens to be a photograph of three generations of Narragansett people. Um, the young person is a brown RISD student, very int interested in art and native history and culture and does a lot of research in archives. Um, the middle is an elder who has done archival research in myriads of places throughout her life and myself. And I, I put that image there to ground us in who has access to collections. Uh, because believe it or not, it's not always as accessible as you'd like to believe, especially in um, historical societies and state archives and maybe mainstream archives that, you know, uh, folks that are academic have access to that the lay uh, person does not. And so looking at who has access to that. Um, in thinking about collections care and I want you to think about um, the idea of Native American advisory councils. Um, I wish we were all face to face so I could get a show of hands as to whose institutions or have worked in institutions that have had Native American advisories. I'm not even aware whether um, the URI library has such a thing in their programming. But in many places, um, across this nation and Canada, they do have Native American advisory councils. And if you don't have one, I advocate for you to do that. Of course, in caring for collections in relationship to Native American collections, it's really helpful if we can increase the number of Native American librarians that we have and archivists, um, increase Native students in the master's in library science programs, um, and of course, that in turn increases archivists that are in um, museum settings as well. Increase the internships and practicums at Native American libraries and archives and expand Native American collections within your own institution and what is considered value. Um, interestingly, a lot of times the Native collections are framed in a colonial construct and only by the colonial perspective. So I encourage people to look for other sources in um, native run institutions and native communities that may be able to be added to your collection. One example of that is um, the Narragansett Dawn, which I know is in the URI collection and is digitized there as well. Um, that's an example of a first person perspective that in many cases is also reflecting on that colonial time period um, when there wasn't as much voice for native people. And so having those news periodicals and um, 
newsletters and magazines and newspapers that are produced by Native communities incorporated into your library collection, it's really, really um, helpful um, to have that first person perspective. It's also important for um, people to think about respecting indigenous ways of knowing, and that includes oral tradition, the documentation of oral tradition um, through audio collections and video collections, um, but also to, in general, respect um, cultural knowledge and non-Western perspectives as being accurate and valid and authentic. So one of the things that I wanted us to think about is um, decolonizing museums and libraries and archives, I should say, um, thinking about who has access, um, who has access for what and why. And one of the things that as Native run archives, there are things that are accessible to the Native American community, things that are accessible to um, the the academic community and things that are accessible to the public at large. Um, and in bigger institutions, often that's not thought about and sometimes everything's pervasively available regardless of tribes' opinions and um, policies around that themselves. Um, what items are kept in your archive and library and who is the keeper of that, meaning who's the gatekeeper? Um, do the Native community have access to it? Do they even know it's there? Do they have the opportunity to have ceremony around certain things in the collection? Um, that, that kind of ties into privilege. Who has access is really connected to privilege. Um, and a lot of times there's a gatekeeper and that can be institutional, it can be the people on the front lines on who has access to these resources. So, and part of that is having culturally competent staff. If you have culturally competent staff um, that understands cultural differences, understands cultural language differences, um, who, who um, understands the, the rights implicit that indigenous people should have to have access to these uh, primary uh, source documents or Native American collections that you have, and to understand that the library or the archive is just a steward of this collection and not the owner, if you will, of the collection and of that knowledge. This goes into a bigger issue around um, diversity, equity, and inclusion and the idea of who's actually included in these institutions and how many students are enrolled um, that are Native American, how many are, are, are guided to have access to these resources, um, and that's a bigger, more pervasive issue around access in general, but I wanted to just kind of make people think about that. Um, this is where partnerships with the Native community comes in really handy. Um, when you have the Native American advisory, it, it creates a, a conduit to access to those resources and to understanding and also to scholarship that can enhance that knowledge over time. So in thinking about what items are kept um, in, in an archival collection um, and who has access to that, it's, it's a complicated um, conversation, but I just wanted people to be thinking about that because sometimes there are things in archival and library collections that are frankly very offensive to indigenous peoples, um, but also some that are very sacred that are also offensive that they're broadly per, uh, available to anyone. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a bit, but I wanted to um, get people thinking about that thinking about what's the difference between sort of a cultural belonging, which is a word that we use a lot versus an artifact, whether you're talking about tangible collections like a basket or a piece of pottery, or whether you're talking about documents that have been written, photographs, paintings, um, uh, you know, maps, um, things that have been made that are often found in archival collections. Um, and those cultural belongings are, we use that term to decolonize that because an artifact often seems very singular 
um, you know, this piece of paper or this newspaper and a cultural belonging is connected to the community and there's an interrelationship there. And that's something that as a native way of thinking is much different than a Western perspective. So um, we're going to be talking about that along the way. And we're also going to be um, talking about research and the challenges of that um, and how we can push forward to have a first person perspective. But to sort of um, finalize some thoughts about um, decolonizing libraries and archives, the idea of having a first person voice there, if you have uh, Native American library librarians and archivists and specialists within the library, you can uh, give that first person perspective on, on these um, books and primary sources that um, can make uh, the researcher and the student think a little bit outside their box and take on a new perspective of that. And that's something that's really important to the Native community because a lot of primary sources are written from one perspective, um, the perspective of the conqueror or of the victor, um, and not necessarily from the indigenous perspective. And so that's kind of when we were, we were using terms within our museum, enculturation versus ethnography, because we're talking about ourselves and representing ourselves in our archive, in our collection, in our exhibits, et cetera. Where often the scholar, the researcher, they're talking about it from a third person perspective and they're taking in information, um, analyzing it and then feeding it back out in their final product, which may or may not be accurate. And so in the fact that many um, primary source documents are if not inaccurate, they may be biased in their perspective and representation of indigenous people. So this is a, a very lovely picture of one of my great nieces. And the purpose of putting that picture there is she's your future library student. Um, but she is proud of her culture. She's steeped in her traditions, um, but she's also a modern American indigenous person learning in the schools and uh, school systems and may end up in your classroom and in your institution um, going forward for library sciences. Maybe she's very interested in being an archivist and sharing her culture through, through that lens. And so decolonizing libraries and archives in, in, is really about inclusion. It's about representation. It's about the opposite of erasure, it's about making visible um, that indigenous perspective. It's humanizing um, indigenous people. I, I kind of have the negative terms in that list, but those are the things that we're often dealing with with decolonizing is the fact that often indigenous people are dehumanized. And so what we want to do is humanize that through um, the work that we do in libraries and archives. Um, we want to break through those um, historical and lateral traumas and to provide justice within this work that we're doing. And that's through creating uh, mechanisms for voice um, and, and, and upholding sovereignty and, and creating equity and making sure that the what's often termed today as microaggressions, which I actually just call aggressions, are, are, are being addressed. And how do we, find those and make ourselves aware of those aggressions that are in the print and things that are in our archives and libraries today and make people aware of them. We're not necessarily going to toss books out, but how can we as educators make sure the people using those books have access to the knowledge that helps them to understand that there is some decolonizing that needs to happen, some representation that needs to happen, and some inclusion that needs to happen within the work that we're doing. And so um, that's something that we're, we're looking to. So, so making culturally relevant services in our archives and libraries, that's kind of what I'm talking about, is, is creating access and opportunity for other librarians and archivists that are not of indigenous culture to understand um, the perspectives and the historical lens of indigenous peoples at, in relationship to the work that they do. Um, creating access um, for the, 
a Native American, I'm going to call them researcher, but person that's interested in that cultural knowledge of their ancestors that may be lying within your institution. Um, believe it or not, there's often times that we're blocked from having access to that of which that's actually ours. I think that there's some fears that people will, will take them or that they'll become no longer part of your collections and things like that, but it's also blocking people from their own primary knowledge. That's from early recordings of audio and video of traditional cultural knowledge to documentation and writings that have happened for researchers and things like that. Um, often keeping in mind that this information is often coming from the first person perspective, which we're gonna talk a little bit more about research and research processes. But I wanna say right now that a lot of times what's being documented has been gathered from the Native community, but not really acknowledging where that knowledge has come from and is then being put into um, people's dissertations and their books and their films and what have you. That's that final documentation, um, but without the real respect and um, of the, the cultural knowledge that was given by the indigenous person, nor the um, understanding of that oral history is of an equal value. So part of that is having that cultural competency training for staff and volunteers um, and students, I would say, within um, library sciences, as well as students that are learning how to use libraries to have that um, cultural competency when they're doing research in different group uh, focus areas so that they would better understand the community. So representation. This is, a, this is a difficult one because we often have a lot of representation in, in libraries, in books, in texts, in uh, newspaper images, you name it, that are, are very poor representation of indigenous peoples. Um, I've certainly given you some, some terrible ones from sports, uh, but also in the media, in books, um, the images are often uh, very derogatory, looking at um, people as less than, as less than human, as um, savage, as um, romanticized, uh, demonized, vilified, um, in a myriad of different uh, stereotypes and biases. The thing that we have to understand is that in these texts, there's implicit, explicit, and systemic bias that takes place. And this is something that we need to make people aware of when they're doing research, that they may actually be utilizing books and materials that are promoting these biases. And if they don't have any even awareness that they should be looking for these implicit and explicit bias within the text, they are, they're going to repeat them. One of my examples of that is, I, I won't mention the particular place, but there's a historical society that I'm aware of that had created this whole history of the Narragansett people. And, um, you know, they think they're doing a good thing. Um, so, you know, about a year or so ago, they republished something that had been published, you know, um, 75 to 100 years ago um, with, you know, some minor tweaking. Um, but what happened is they actually continued to perpetuate um, inaccuracies within this text by republishing it and making it available. Now, of course, even without doing that in libraries and archives, these materials are often there and they may be in inaccurate. So in that particular one, the thing that sticks out to me is that, you know, according to them, you know, um, indigenous peoples of this area were cannibals. And that's something that's being perpetuated. That's an inaccuracy and a complete lie, but yet it's something that gets put forward in text. And so when we talk about making people aware of these stereotypes and bias, we need to make sure that we're not perpetuating them. And part of that is the teaching, um, having instructors and instruction that is culturally competent and culturally relevant, um, but also making sure that that's being presented over and over again so that it's not just being done for one group of students and never again. Um, that's where Native American advisories come in. That's where partnerships with tribal communities and tribal archives and 
and libraries comes in. It's where um, having good protocols around research comes in and, and learning around stereotypes and bias um, is really, really important uh, for not only the Native community that we're specifically talking about today, but also across um, diverse communities. So <laughs> I've given you an absolutely horrific image, but it's a very standard image that's in places, um, you know, hatchets and teepees and headdresses. And I wanted to just briefly, because this is a whole other talk in general, but I wanted to very briefly want you to be aware that imagery is harm. It's stereotyping and dehumanizing. It, it invalidates your own students, the Native students that are in your institutions, um, and, and fosters negative identity um, and self-esteem. It um, can be a form of bullying, um, as well as promote violence. And the statistics around Indigenous violence that has been perpetrated against Indigenous people is, is vast. Um, and that includes suicide and assault rates and murder and you know overall racial inequality. And a lot of times in books and in resources, um, these things are perpetuated within library systems um, by continuing to have old films and old uh, books that continue to represent Indigenous people in this inequitable and dehumanized way. Um, and so that's where the education has to come in, you know, and decide. And that's where advisory councils can help support on what books should remain and what books should not within your collections. But also, if they're going to remain, what kind of education should happen around that? Historical images are a big issue um, because they often represent points in history very inaccurately. The, the artists tend to do those images hundreds of years later when things have now been uh, romanticized and uh, glorified in different kinds of ways and not represent at all. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this, but I wanted you to be thinking about it because in textbooks, images like the two that I presented here, um, some of which you can see on the RISD site that I've um, hyperlinked. If you look up the Rhode Island School of Design, you can find a couple of um, Native American images, the Sachem and then the landing of Roger Williams. And I actually reflect on them in audio recordings for educators. So you can check those out if you're looking for them. If you go to our own website, um, tomacogmuseum.org slash resources, we have them hyperlinked there. So don't worry if you don't catch it right now. But I want people to understand that these are very inaccurate portraits. Um, they are pieces of art, not actually history, but they're represented in historical textbooks as being factual, supporting the factual content in history books. So things to think about. Um, diversity, equity, and inclusion in books. <laughs> I have a lovely picture of a Native author that came to Tomaquag Museum and um, she is, was sharing her, her book that she published. Um, but I encourage libraries to really take a look at their native collection. You know, sometimes people will say, I have a native collection and, and that's wonderful. But then I challenge them to ask themselves, well, how many of those books in that native collection are actually written by indigenous peoples? Um, and that number gets significantly lower. And then I ask them, well, how many are actually written by indigenous peoples where your institution is located? And then that number gets even lower. Um, and then how many of those books are from a variety of um, genres? Then that gets even lower. Um, and so I really encourage the libraries to take a look at, you know, what is their indigenous or Native American collection? What kinds of books and genres are represented and how many of those books are indigenously you know authored by indigenous peoples native american peoples and and certainly as institutions in rhode island how many books do you have that actually talk about the indigenous peoples of rhode island or nearby southern new england and how many of those are actually written by or contributed by um, the Native community. And when I say books, I'm really meaning more broadly things in your archives and collections as well. Um, of course, books are a little more tangible than every piece of paper in your archive, um, maps and 
photographs and things of that nature gets a little more complex to, to get a number for, but just to be thinking about that in that way. Um, so, thinking about books, I've, I've put a couple here um, that are about local tribal communities. Um, Calamano is actually written by John Christian Hopkins, a University of Rhode Island graduate and author. Um, he's written a variety of books um, and they're on a variety of topics. This one happens to be a historical fiction, but he also does poetry and, and nonfiction. Um, and this other is a non-native written book, but it is about Ellison Tarzan Brown, a very famous Narragansett person. So I want us to think about the kinds of books that are available to the community that represent indigenous peoples. Um, this book, Calamagno, he pronounces it Calamagno, because uh, we had him here speaking, um, is really a historical fiction about what if, after King Philip's War, um, Metacomet's son, who gets taken into slavery in the Caribbean if he escapes. So that's where the premise starts. But the idea is that native books can be fiction, they can be nonfiction, but it's the idea of having these native authored in this perspective that we're really looking for. Um, and that's really important. So we want to have authenticity and accuracy and indigenous perspectives in, in the, the resources that are in the library. Um, and of course, partnerships with places like Tomaquag Museum and other native archives and collections like over at Pequot Museum and Research Center um, can give you an idea of what kinds of resources are out there. You can utilize oyate.org, uh, which is a wonderful resource for purchasing Native American books that have been vetted. Of course, they're doing it from clear across the country, so there's a variety of them from a variety of locations. You can also look at the American Indian Library Association if you're not catching this, I put some links at the end um, to go over some of these things again. Um, so don't feel uh, badly if you didn't catch it. So in evaluating books, I've used this book. Um, for those that didn't know, I was a, an elementary school teacher for quite a long time um, before I became the executive director here. I've taught every grade from kindergarten to grade eight and college students um, and even high school students in a more ad hoc way. But nonetheless, um, this book uh, always just triggers me <laughs> because it is so full of stereotypes and bias and inaccuracies and um, subliminal messaging and things of that nature. So I want you to be thinking about as you're putting um, children's books and other, you know, every age group of books, really. Um, but a children's book is an easy way to sort of look at um, representation, because it's usually really clear. I mean, this is an award-winning book. However, it is wholly inaccurate. It's representing Chief Seattle's words from uh, a speech that he gave when um, they were being subjugated during conquest. Um, and, you know, everything from this cover image where the the Native American man is floating off into the clouds and is virtually being erased from this land um, to other images that perpetuate stereotype and bias and inaccuracies and um, romanticize and dehumanize and, and the list just goes on around um, indigenous peoples. And so this is something that you have to think about when you're evaluating the books. Um, even, even longer books, I mean, adult books. Um, we get asked this sometimes, we've kind of stopped doing it um, because it, it's such a big process to truly evaluate someone's manuscript. Um, and we're not doing it regularly right now. We just don't have staff capacity, but we've done it in the past. And it's one of those things where you really have to read carefully. People's word choice matters. Um, and the, the way that they represent indigenous peoples in retelling that history matters. So speaking of history, it's really important for people to really ground themselves in the fact that there is no US history without indigenous or Native American or Indian history. Um, and that there are indigenous people in all walks of life, um, which is often underrepresented. Um, I happen to put this picture of John Bennett Harring Harrington, who's a Chickasaw astronaut because um, teachers and educators often only represent Native American people in two forms. One, 
you know, Thanksgiving time, Native American History Month, you know, the pilgrims come, that fictional lens, and westward expansion and the demise of all indigenous people as the other, as the pervasive narrative. And so what we're trying to get them to understand is that indigenous people were here prior to European contact, during European contact, through industrialization, urbanization, and so on to the 21st century and are still here. And um, they bring vibrancy to this country and to our state and to our communities, um, but they're often represented in very stereotypical ways. And so we want people to think about that when they're thinking about the collection, are they giving a diversity of, of representation of what is in what it is to be indigenous in the United States or in the world, well, North America today. Um, and so we have to think about that. And I also just kind of put another lens in here, just as something to think about, because I've often heard people say, well, you know, Native American people, they didn't write things down. So we don't have that documentation for prior to European contact. So we only have the documentation that um, is from a Eurocentric perspective in those early primary sources. And I will push back and say that oral history is a valid thing and that it should be recognized and respected. Um, and basket stamping is one way that things were documented and stories were told. Wampum belts was another, ledger paintings from out west and other places um, through music and through photography um, once that became available. Um, and paintings of all different sorts, um, whether that were um, stone paintings like on uh, rock shelters and things of that nature. So just to have that in mind that there's other depictions of other kinds of communication, including sign language and a myriad of others that was, were ways that things were represented. So I just wanted to take a moment and think about NAGPRA in relationship to archives and collections. And people might think, hmm, where does this fit? Um, I just, I really wanted people to think about it for a moment because there, there's ethics that are involved in NAGPRA in relationship to funerary items and ceremonial knowledge. Um, but those things can also be in connection to things that are in our archives and collections. Um, and I want us to think about that. Who decides? what is allowable in your archives and collections and who decides who has access to those things? Um, who decides who has the right to write these things um, and to create imagery and capture them in those ways? Um, there are procedures and protocols within tribal communities and their um, <sighs> historic preservation offices in relationship to NAGPRA and I know it doesn't directly relate, but I want people to think about it because there's an equity issue here in what is represented and what is exposed to students and researchers and the like in relationship to ceremonial um, items in a digital or in a, in a book or manuscript or uh, archival format. And so I just wanted us to think about that as you go forward. Who has access to those? Whose knowledge is it? And whose intellectual knowledge is it? And whose cultural knowledge is it? Um, and the academic research versus sacred human rights. Um, there's a book that's about um, burials in Rhode Island. I actually have it here in the archive and I don't even want to really even show the book because I feel that it just encourages people to want to look at it. Um, but I'm horrified by it. Um, it, it documents um, burial grounds, sacred burial grounds for the Narragansett people. Um, and there was no, to my knowledge, input by native people in that um, process of that book. Um, no um, consultations. Um, and just actual burials are photographed and depicted in this book. And for, for me, that is really a problem. Um, I think that book may have been done just before NAGPRA became a thing. Um, but it's something to think about who has access to those kinds of things and whether it's right or not.
you know, Western ways of knowing, they think everything is available to everyone. Um, in my opinion, sometimes too much is available and people ought to think about, would you want your family members and their graves to be available to the general public? Just a little something to think about. Um, with that being said, does your library or archive have a ceremonial space? If there are things like this book that I'm referencing that are in your archives and collections that are um, very, very sacred and ceremonial, um, sometimes you'll find in archives um, prayers that have been written down um, from, from, fun from funerals and things like that. Um, there may be um, other kinds of ceremonial documentation that's there. Um, is there an opportunity for someone to have to perform a ceremony in relationship to those items? That's something to think about. Um, is that an opportunity for the Native community? So going on to or going back to um, research, I want to um, think about um, to do with my notes. There we go. Um, I wanted to think about the Institutional Review Board. I know the URI has an Institutional Review Board. Um, I did try to find um, information online about it. I didn't necessarily see that. That URL at the bottom happens to be a really good one that I found um, um, on online that gave really a lot of detail and information in regards to Native American collections. So of course, you're supposed to collaborate with tribal nations. Um, you're supposed to comply with their tribal requirements and request permissions for research. Um, you should be providing uh, not, not only requesting permission, but creating a, a memorandum of understanding so that everybody's in the same place and that there are safeguards that are established um, to protect um, cultural knowledge. You should um, be providing reports and presentations and updates as, as requested and at least yearly um, feedback. Um, that should be also feedback from the tribe as well as feedback from the research in the research team. Um, updating tribal governments regarding that, um, requesting and securing permissions. Um, it's really important that, um, that you respect sovereignty. Indigenous nations like the Narragansett Nation and other indigenous nations across this region and across this nation, they are part of 576 now federally recognized tribal nations and that sovereignty gives them the right to self-determination, self-regulation um, and uh, you know to protect their rights and their citizenry um, to the best of their ability um, and to self-govern. And so with that, institutions need to respect that sovereignty and make sure that they're following the proper protocols in order to um, conduct research about the Narragansett tribe or any other tribal nation. Um, you should respect cultural norms and um, reflect the cultural protections and continuation and what, what I mean by that is just making sure that you're um, being accurate and, and collecting information from authentic voices. Um, and that's really important, and multiple voices. Um, the best research is multiple voices. Just like in any community, no one voice is the voice of everyone. Um, just as I'm not the one voice of, for my whole community, no one else is either. Um, you wanna be able to give as much um, feedback as possible. And one of the things that a lot of tribal communities find is researchers come in, they do their research and we never hear a thing back and there's no benefit to the community as a, as a whole for why that research was even done. Um, make sure you listen to feedback, um, that you respect the partnership with the tribal community and that you respect their, their own cultural and intellectual property. And I'm gonna give an example of this. My mother, when she was young, she did the heritage tours across the state and took people to all these different landmarks around the state about and told about Narragansett history and culture. And she told me this story about um, how when she was done, a student took, that had taken the tour literally documented everything that she said and handed it in um, as her thesis. And 
no real um, recognition to the intellectual knowledge of my mother at the time um, or of the Native community as a whole. Some people are doing this really well today where they're partnering with the Native community and giving credit where credit's due, but there are also a lot of people doing research that are not giving credit where the credit is due. And there's this idea that if it's oral, then it's free for the taking. And that's not really true. Um, you need to respect tribal cultural and intellectual knowledge and property. So continuing on research for a bit, um, I think I've mentioned this quite a bit about having access for the Native American community to the Native American collections that you have, um, making sure that in your research that you get as many first person voices as you can, um, that you have a diversity in your collection. Um, and this image is to give you some ideas about that Native American news periodicals and newsletters and articles and magazines um, that are have been going on for quite some time. I mentioned Narragansett Dawn, but there are others um, across Rhode Island as well as across the nation that um, add indigenous voice to the research that's available for people within your libraries and archives, special collections. So we have um, quite a few resources. Of course, I've given you Tomaquag Museum resources, but I wanted you to also um, be aware of the American Indian Library Association, the Association of Tribal Archives, Libraries, and Museums. I mentioned oyate.org before. Um, and then there's NMAI, the National Museum of the American Indian has quite a bit of resources as well. Um, let's see. And then I also gave quite a few um, websites to tribal um, tribal nations, um, some of which also have archives and libraries and or museums um, that also have those resources that may be very helpful when you're thinking about partnering with others and guiding uh, researchers to great resources. Um, There's so many more things to say, I'm sure, but um, I wanted to um, at least be able to touch base on on most of these things um, as best as that I best that I can in this short amount of time. So here I think I'll stop because I never stopped before and see if um, we have any questions. Yes, there are quite a few of them. So let's start with a with a relatively easy factual one. Um, what's the title and author of the picture book event from your museum? Mm, let me see if I can remember her name, Colleen. Let me see if I can go back to that slide for a second, because right now I'm drawing a blank on her name. I know it's Colleen. Um, <laughs> of course, I've got it so small, I can't remember it, and I don't, uh, I will carry you. Um, it's a children's book. We have it in our collection, but our uh, assistant director is planning children's hour, and since we might have to do it digital, she's got all the books home revising how we were going to do it this year, and it's I Will Carry You by Colleen, um, hmm, I cannot think of her last name, let me see. Colleen Farwell. Farwell, thank you for that, because I couldn't remember. Um, Dawnland Voices, if you don't, aren't familiar with it, that was an image that was also on this, um, on this slide. Um, whoa. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it's an anthology of indigenous writings from New England. Um, we partnered in that book. Um, there are, there's a Narragansett section, but there's also 10 other Native American uh, nations from New England that are represented. That's not all of them, um, but just like any book, you have to have a start and a finish. So this got to be where it ended, um, but there is a really good chapter about um, Narragansett people that has archival uh, materials, um, you know, letters and speeches and uh, things of that nature, as well as books and booklets and um, poetry and a variety of other kinds of writing that's included in that. All right. 
I worked at the New England Historic Genealogical Society, and often we have clients call to ask how to trace their Native American ancestry or those who have taken a DNA test that shows a small amount of Native American heritage. How would you address this? Yeah, the first thing I tell people is we don't do genealogy, one. But two, um, you know, there's you know, such a controversy about that. I would suggest one thing is people to listen to the podcast, All My Relations. It's done by Matika Wilbur and Adrian Keene, who's a professor at Brown, and it's called All My Relations. It's an audio podcast, and they do a really good, actually two-part segment on blood quantum and sort of genealogy and things like that. Um, and, and, you know, those tests are, are such a problem because in this realm, because it doesn't tell you who you are. It just tells you you have some dribble of Native American blood somewhere. And that often that gives people hope in a way that is kind of unreasonable unless they actually can do their genealogy. And that just takes a lot of work um, and a lot of um, connecting the dots, actual you know, birth, death, marriage records that get you to who you are. Um, it's easier for people who are just a generation or so away from their Native American ancestry. If they're very far back, it's very, very difficult to do. Um, there are, you know, lots of gene genealogical societies that I would recommend that you send them to. The Rhode Island Genealogical Society is, is a good one that does a lot of work. Um, you know, they can use those genealogical tools that are online, um, you know, that map your families and things like that. And if it, it may get you closer but it doesn't necessarily make you a tribal member and tribal citizenship is very complex. Um, and even if you can prove your genealogy, doesn't mean that you'll become a tribal citizen. Um, doesn't take away from who you are and what lineage you have in your, in your family lines. However, it, it doesn't necessarily make you a tribal citizen either. And that's like a whole nother talk. We could talk about that for three hours, if not three days. Um, it's very, very complex. Okay, um, there is a request that the resources and links be made available after the webinar. Sure, I can send those to you, Peter. Cool, and I'm gonna send out a follow-up email after the uh, the webinar to uh, the entire participants list, just so people can see the, uh, uh, hopefully we will get a good recording, so. Yeah, um, so one of, the, one of the things I did do is I minimized my, um, website because I wanted people to see this one too. This was that one I was referring to. Um, it's the University of Alaska Fairbanks that has their institutional review board, which really had a really great complex procedure around working with indigenous communities um, that I thought that would be something that certainly URI could look at and, and make into practice. And this is where having an advisory group is really helpful because then they could support um, what makes sense for here. Um, but you can always start with something and then expand on it. It's always better than nothing. Um, then I also had the oyate.org, um, which is a book resource um, site that's vetted by um, Native American folks um, that I thought was really useful. Um, and then this is the American Indian Library Association, which also um, does a lot of great stuff. They have it so that you can go in as a tribal public, academic, or school, um, and, and kind of look at it from different lenses. And so they also have American Indian Youth Literature Awards, which would give you great ideas of what things to put in your library. We use this as a resource because um, as much as we'd like to fill our, our library here at the museum with just Southern New England tribal books and things like that, there are so few um, Native authors um, statistically um, that that doesn't fill our library. So we also have authors from other places. And if you're not aware of this, the Association of Tribal Archives, Libraries and Museums is another tremendously fabulous uh, resource. And if you get a chance to go to their conference, even though it's the Tribal Archives, Libraries and Museum Conference, it doesn't mean that only tribal people go. Um, there's librarians and archivists that work for tribal entities that go, but also people from bigger institutions that work with Native American collections that go. So um, it's really a great conference. I've been several times and even presented a couple of times. Um, 
that you might consider. Um, whoops, that's my WebEx. We don't want to see that. <laughs> so just to, I'll send those links at the end, but I just wanted to give you a quick peek at those. Um, oh, you get to see my grandson. This is Minakisu Mequin. He's 23 uh, months old now. Another question? Yes. Um, let's see. Uh, what advice would you have on maintaining awareness of indigenous issues specifically for people at the beginning of a career in information services? Yeah, so I think that, you know, cultural competency training has to be cyclical and it has to keep wrapping around. Um, there's an information layer that they can get as a first layer and then depending on their, their, um, their experience and their, um, expertise area can go in a deeper dive. I think that it's really important for everyone to revisit this often. Um, one, because this knowledge um, is not pervasively out there. Most people did not learn about Native American history, culture, the arts, the environment, our, our, our life ways in any real way. Um, most people had very poor educational experiences regarding this. And I'm not teacher bashing, I was a teacher. Um, but they weren't taught it properly either. So there's this generational misrepresentation over and over again about indigenous um, peoples. And so I think that when we're, we're even the best well-meaning people are often perpetuating inaccuracies and misconceptions and, and biases that they're not even aware of. So I think that cultural competency training is really important and for it to, to, to happen more than once. I, I find that when it comes to Native cultural particular, often it's a one-off. We do it once and we check the box and then we move on. But the next group of people that come into that institution didn't get it. And, and the people that had it, it was the first time they were inundated with a ton of information around Native history and culture. Um, and, and to think about those biases that they may have, um, we all have them, we're human, we all have biases. It's being aware of them, that's what cultural competency is about. It's about becoming aware that we all have them and how can we address them in the work that we do and how can we make sure that we're not passing them along. Um, and, and part of that is just becoming aware of them and then also learning um, strategies around um, better representation and across the board for all people, but in this case specifically for indigenous people, which really truly are the most underrepresented um, community and in, in the nation, and yet it's our homeland. And so um, it's part of that whole historical trauma and the erasure of indigenous peoples um, and in, in this nation. It's part of the history and the trauma of conquest. And that's a whole nother talk, but, but it's one of those things that people have to understand and unpack that, then they can change the way that that flows and make sure that people are included. You know, I, I tell, you know, the K-12 teachers all the time, there's nothing that happens here in the United States that indigenous people are not part of in one way or another. But yet we often teach about it in an isolated bubble over here and everything else that happens in the United States over here and never should they meet. In reality, it's all woven together and that there is nothing that's happened in this country that does not include indigenous peoples. Um, in one way or another, and that there's people within all walks of life um, doing all kinds of, of careers and pathways um, and academia and you name it, it's, it's all incorporated. And we need to be able to make sure that when we're representing it and we're guiding researchers that they also are representing it that way. Why, if they're studying space, they're not mentioning, you know, um, indigenous astronauts, or if they're studying politics, why they're not talking about the indigenous people serving in Congress and uh, the first uh, Native American vice president who was from the Kaw Nation, you know, those kinds of things um, that are often just overlooked because people just don't have it in their mindset to even think about it unless they're thinking, oh, I'm doing a Native American history research. They, they don't even think to incorporate indigenous peoples in the lens of everything else that's happening. Cool. Could you give some examples of things that might be inappropriate to bring into a university archives. Can you think of something that a sensible archivist should say? I think that sometimes in university archives, they have a lot of student work 
<laughs> and not that you shouldn't have it there, but I think that sometimes there needs to be some, some work around it um, and, and some conversations, even if it's um, in the finding aid, there's some comment about thinking about it critically because sometimes it's inaccurate. It's just, you know, regurgitated inaccuracies over and over again. Um, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, there's that one book I was thinking of specifically that, you know, literally was showing graves. I have a problem with that. Um, I don't think that's appropriate. Um, to me, if it's got to be in your archives, I think it needs to be in your very special collections. And I, I personally think that Native communities um, from that community, Native people from that community should be the ones that have access to that knowledge and information. However, that's not always how that works. Um, and I understand public institutions have rules around <laughs> public access, and I get that. Um, but I also know that sometimes public access is restricted from people from those said communities in which that information is about. So it's kind of figuring out a balance. And this is where the advisory can come in and help people make decisions on a case-by-case -case basis on what is accessible readily to everybody in, under the sun and what maybe shouldn't be published online in your digital archive that anybody can have access to. So I think that that's where the, the advisory council really becomes really helpful. Um, I serve on advisory councils for other, other institutions. Um, I would say if you're planning an advisory council, you need to be really thoughtful about that um, and you need to be broad based because um, there's more than, even though there's one federally recognized tribe in Rhode Island, there are tribal nations that are intersected with Rhode Island geographically. Um, you know, there's Poconoket Wampanoag, there's the Nipmuc people that historically are, are inside what we call the bounds of Rhode Island, even if today their, their, their lands are in Massachusetts. Um, but with that being said, there's also collections within institutional collections that are beyond Rhode Island. So you might think of um, indigenous people from a variety of places and also um, think about the fact that they're spending a lot of time to do that work. Um, and a lot of advisory councils that I've served on, they also have some kind of honoraria for people with the idea that indigenous people are the most underfunded community um, in Rhode Island. We're still the most impoverished population. We're five times below the white majority and three times below every other ethnicity. Um, and there's a whole complex reason why that is. Um, and, you know, it, it's a whole talk on colonization and conquest, but we can't spend all our time doing that. But just to tip that off, with that being in, in, in mind, often those same people are, are overextended um, trying to support all these institutions that need the support and knowledge that they have to do this kind of work um, to, to, to improve uh, advocacy for indigenous peoples and to advise um, institutions on how to do this work better. Do we have time for a couple more questions or? Sure. Okay, cool. Um, can you talk a bit about subject keyword labeling? Um, terms that may be culturally insensitive may be more well known and enable sure. greater findability, but more appropriate terms might translate to less discovery. Is there a way to? Yeah, so that that's always complex because, you know, we do that here where we have decolonized some of our terminology and that makes it difficult for other people to understand. Um, I, you know, this is the tricky part. I've used probably all of the words at one point in time. I've used Native American, American Indian, Indian, um, but there's First Nations, there's First Peoples, there's Aboriginal, there's Indigenous um, that all mean and are all thought of in, as synonyms to Native American. Um, so I, I hear your pain on that. Um, and But what I would say is as you're keywording a book, think about how they're keywording it. So like this is a book that we, I'm trying to get in the window here, that we self-published at Tomaquag Museum and we use the word indigenous a lot in this particular book. But you might also put, because we probably didn't put Native American in here at all, but you might put in your, in your uh, word, you know, search words, also Native American, so that if someone else is putting Native American, even though we're using the word indigenous, they still would find it. Um, in this book here, it's a children's book um, from Oyate. Can you see it? I think so. 
but it's called First Nations families because it's really from over the line in Canada. First Nations is used a little bit more, but we always try to remind people we did not put the line here. And there's lots of people um, that are sort of bordering the northern border that also go by the term First Nations um, versus Native American. So that's something to think about. Um, I think that if they use like this book here, it's another children's book, it's called Clambake. It's uh, about a Wampanoag Clambake. Um, of course, this could also be Narragansett in that we're similar in this way, that we're Eastern Woodland Coastal people. So it's a great resource guide for anyone that wants to understand a traditional Clambake. Um, but they use a Wampanoag story. So you might use terms like Native American, Clambake, um, uh, traditional life ways, um, uh, ceremony, things of that nature. So th there's lots of different keywords. And again, an advisory council can help support staff in that, especially with ones that are, are difficult um, to discern what would be the best word choice to have as your keywords to help searches. Um, and, you know, every single book is going to have a little bit more difficulty in that um, book or, or even uh, magazine, like this one's the, the National Museum of the American Indian. Well, that's, they call it the American Indian in this, in this construct. Um, you know, when we tick the census, we have to click American Indian. Um, so th these are all, you know, or Native American. Um, those are things that we have, even if we don't prefer those terms. I mean, ideally speaking, indigenous peoples of each nation would prefer to be called what they are from their nation, whether that's Narragansett, or Wampanoag, or Pequot, or Mohegan, or, you know, Dene, or Lakota, you know, whatever the nation is. And I think that we don't have that choice since there's over 576 federally recognized tribal nations, plus state recognized nations, plus ones that are not recognized but still exist. Um, so that there's all of that complexity there. So if they name, first off, a good book names a nation. You know, um, a book that's written by a native person to name a nation. Um, I may not have mentioned that when I was talking about evaluating books. Mind you, when I do a presentation on evaluating books, I can spend two hours just talking about ways to evaluate books. Um, and I'm trying to get a lot in in a little bit of time today. But um, the, um, lost my thought just then. Um, the idea around the naming the nation is really important. So if the key word, obviously, if they may, they mention a nation like the Narragansett Nation, then you should have that as one of your key words. Um, but if they don't, um, that's also when I would say that the book is a little more suspect and probably isn't written by a Native person um, in any kind of way. Somewhere in there should say where it's from. Uh, Another question? Okay. Um, what is your thought about land acknowledgements? I've heard opinions both in favor and against. So um, I'm totally think? for land acknowledgements. I think the people that are against land acknowledgements, um, if they're indigenous, it's more about the fact that um, we need to go even deeper um, than that. Um, I've been on several panels about land acknowledgements, and I've, I've heard that conversation. Pe tribes that are a little west of here, they're kind of not done with it, but wanting more. Um, here on the east, we've been so slow getting to the gate. We need to at least get there. Um, if you go to our website, to our belongings blog, I did a whole essay on how to think about writing land acknowledgements and gave some examples from around the nation in the links. Um, as examples of good land acknowledgements as well. Um, I also did that. I, I let them publish it in the NEMA magazine as well, the New England Museum Association magazine, but it's on our blog. Um, I, I think you most definitely should do a land acknowledgement. I think that um, you should, um, if you're in Rhode Island, you should be recognizing the Narragansett Nation as the only federally recognized nation in the state. Um, uh, if you are on specifically Narragansett lands, you should just be recognizing, which the University of Rhode Island is, just na the Narragansett people um, and the Narragansett nation. If you are hosting a conference in Rhode Island and um, you want to acknowledge the, the only federally recognized tribal nation and then also the historic homelands of the Nipmuc, 
the Poconocet, Wampanoag, and the Niantic peoples, then I am all for that. But I don't think that that should preclude the recognition of the Narragansett Nation as the only federally recognized nation in the state. Um, and no matter what state people are from, they should be recognizing it. If you're having a large gathering, you should be recognizing um, the homelands that you're on. And when I did my short little intro, I didn't spend a lot of time on that today because um, I uh, wanted to make sure we had enough time to talk about other things. Um, but I did recognize that you're on the homelands of the Narragansett people. And most of what is Rhode Island is the homelands of the Narragansett. And you know, we didn't put the little imaginary boundaries here. Um, some of what is Connecticut is the homelands to Narragansett people, and some of what is Massachusetts is the homelands to the Narragansett people, and vice versa for some of those other tribal nations, all of which had kinship relationships with, um, or most of which had kinship relationships with the Narragansett people, those tribes that I just mentioned, um, and uh, were in an, a, were allied together or in allegiance together. Shall we continue or are you ready to call it a day? Uh, I can I can do another one if you'd like. Okay, let's see. Um, so here's one that's um, uh, it's a little long. I advise under-resourced cultural heritage repositories and archival best practices. Often I visit communities that display community history and imagery that depicts Native Americans in a stereotyped and derogatory way, such as townspeople dressed up as American Indians in, quote, Order of the Red Man fraternal parades. How do you recommend helping communities become more sensitive to their bias and treat these archival materials responsibly when it involves the telling and preservation of their community and history, which may not be inclusive? Yeah, I think that, you know, one of the ways that you can do that is by having um, projects where Native communities get to respond to it. Um, you know, I've been part of projects where we've responded to maps in that way. I've been part of projects where we've responded to images and toys and games. Um, reality is this country is founded on conquest and the people that they were conquering were indigenous people. And so in order to do that, you had to dehumanize and vilify indigenous people. I mean, if you had, if, if, if the Declaration of Independence was the original was in your archive, I mean, that vilifies and dehumanizes indigenous peoples, calling us merciless Indian savages whose known rules of warfare is an indistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. However, you can bring in indigenous people to take a look at that, maybe to do an artistic response, to do a written response, a poetic response, some kind of labeling that is responding to that. Um, Part of that helps to teach others, but then of course you can invite people to speak, um, to have you know cultural um, presentations that speak to that bias and represent and open up people's viewpoints around the history of whatever particular um, image or writing that's being represented. Um, you can do cultural competency with your staff, um, training so that they can better understand it and better articulate it um, in, in, in doing that. You can also decolonize in your um, finding aids. There, in my opinion, there's no reason that people can't. Why can't there be, you know, after there's the little paragraph that tells what it is, you know, here's somebody that, you know, has been asked to sort of decolonize that piece so that when the next researcher comes along and takes a look at it, oh, well, maybe they never thought of that, but because that little you know, paragraph or two is there, maybe that'll get them to think about it. And so that's a couple of quick ways that you can think about doing that. Um, it's an ongoing process, which is why I keep saying that um, cultural competency training is an ongoing process and it's cyclical because it keeps coming around as new things come to people's awareness and you start to look at it in a critical lens. It's teaching people to be critical readers and thinkers and you know i'm speaking to choirs of critical speak you know people that are critically thinking all the time but this is opening up a different perspective that maybe wasn't taught to um the staff at these institutions in the same way other kinds of critical thinking skills were it's focused in on an area that most people don't have a lot of extensive knowledge and frankly working in a native american museum as i do people that 
have PhDs in history about native cultures don't necessarily have cultural competency. Just having historical record knowledge doesn't give you cultural competency. Um, I have had circumstances within the last uh, five years where there have been college professors that have been um, teaching Native American studies courses. And in my opinion, every single teacher that's teaching Native American studies should be, and if they're not indigenous themselves, should be doing a cultural competency training exercise uh, before they teach that class. Um, because things are still happening, you know, in the 21st century that are completely outrageous. Um, I know Native students that were in a, a, a mainstream college classroom on Native American studies. They were just a couple of kids amongst the, their, their peers that were all non-Native, and the professor had them uh, creating fictional Native tribes based on the region and the resources that was historically available. Um, that was like the biggest mistake ever. Um, luckily for these students, they had enough strength because one, they weren't the only one this time, there was a couple of them. And two, some of them had uh, familial uh, competencies that gave them enough courage to go and complain and, and say something to someone over top of their head so that this could get rectified. But most native kids that are in a college classroom often don't have that peer network and often don't have an adult network that can help them have that um, courage to step up and say what they're, what's being assigned is wrong. All right, thank you. I think we probably should call it here. Um, so, Loren, thank you very much. You're welcome, Kanupiam. And I hope to see all of you in person. Uh, the hardest part of this, Zoom, this um, webinar is that I couldn't see any of your faces. I would have loved to have seen um, all the visitors that were in the room, in this virtual room, uh, and see who you are and, and uh, smile at your faces. So um, I hope you are all staying well in this time of COVID-19. And I look forward to seeing you at Tamaquag Museum uh, when this quarantine is lifted. And in the meantime, check us out on our website and social media. There's lots of other resources on our YouTube page and the like.